Today we're going to be covering site design, and so we've moved out of earthwork and we're on to a new topic today. And this is, uh, site design is what we, we talk about usually for smaller developments. Now, sometimes there can be kind of larger developments as well. And it's designing the site that goes around the building. And so that's uh, where the name comes from on site design. So it's your building site. And this often includes all utilities that come into the building, the roads and the access ways, the uh, parking lots, uh, uh, sidewalks, any anything outside of the actual building walls uh, for that, right? So the, one of the consulting firms I used to work at, it was uh, mostly an architectural firm, and they had a lot of, our, obviously, building development projects and uh, designing new buildings, new libraries, and and so forth. And then in as a civil engineer working for that company, my job was to design everything outside of the building. And so we did the parking lots, we did... Uh, driveways, we checked turn radiuses, we uh, made sure we could accommodate uh, tour buses in one instance. Uh, we looked at, we had enough parking and made sure the parking looked, worked well. The, the drainage on the site, the storm water was able to move off site. We also designed all the sewer lines and the water lines going in and out of the building. Uh, from that, if there's buried power, we at least show that on the plans. There's not a lot of design into that that's it's outside of the power company uh, working on that so it, it is pretty holistic it's pretty much everything outside the building the only thing we wouldn't do as a civil engineer is do landscaping we would leave the areas for the landscaping but there'd be a landscape architect that would do all that and the pretty stuff and figuring out which you know flowers and shrubs and trees whatever they wanted to plant uh, there but everything else uh, outside fell on the on the civil engineers and that's site design and this is often a big piece of senior design. So next year when you take your senior design class, just keep this in mind that uh, that's one of the reasons we, we cover this in this class is so that you won't be quite lost when you get to uh, doing uh, your senior design projects right through there. And, and really mid, mid to smaller sized engineering firms, they do a lot of site design. That's it's sometimes their, their bread and butter uh, through there. Bigger firms tend to get into more of the government work doing highway design and, and bigger roads uh, through that. And they can still do a little bit of site design uh, through there, but it's, it tends to be more that mid-sized or small local place that does site design. Sometimes an architect from, uh, someone will get hired to do a building like on campus here at Valparaiso, you get an architect from California to come in and design the Christopher Center. But the site design is often uh, done by a local firm. And because the local firm knows what the local rules are for that, and understands the environment in the area better and may have you know better contacts for surveyors or may have their own in-house surveyors to do a lot of the grade uh, calculations and the topo for it uh, to get started they've worked with the city before in that area so it's a pretty common thing that even if it's a fancy building and you've got an uh, out-of-state architect designing it they'll work with a local firm to do site design and it's a little bit of give and take they'll They'll say what they want to see in their vision, the architects talk, their vision for what this the site is going to be. And then the civil engineers get to tell them, well, you don't have enough parking. Sorry about your vision, but we're going to put some more spaces over here because you got to meet the ordinance. <laughs> so that's, that used to be my job uh, in one place. So this is what we this is what's covered in that site design. Uh, again, we're looking at building sites. And again, it is al almost always run by an architecture firm is the lead on the project for that and that's what it comes down to you know the the owner is going to hire a team but the team is led by architects almost always sometimes as a site designer you work for the architectural firm directly and a lot of times you're also it could well be that you're just a consulting a sub consultant actually to the architectural firm for that right through there we our architects used to be stingy they didn't like to pay even though we were in the same same uh, company they didn't, they didn't like to let the, the civils do the site design stuff. They wanted to try to do it themselves, and they always screwed it up pretty badly, right? So their vision doesn't work very well when it comes down to nuts and bolts, All right? So uh, we do the entrances, the driveways. Um, I worked on a bank project for a drive-in bank, and we had to meet all the in-dot requirements for driveways to there, and it helps to be, you know, so stuff we've already covered, the intersection site distance, uh, had radiuses and all that it hit directly into that kind of work and that we knew how to deal with the state. We understood what the state's pavement sections look like and how to pull them out. 
for that and how to do traffic counts for them and all that. And so you had to prove to the state that your driveway uh, would be adequate and was in a good location. And that's common even not on a state project, but even if you're just doing a local project for a county or on a road on a county road or a city street, they've got uh, your local jurisdiction has rules about that. And as a civil engineer, you'd be expected to know that. And again, that's another reason for picking a local site design firm. They're, they're familiar with what all the regulations are in that area. Drainage is a big issue, as always. Uh, it's a it's a huge issue. Sometimes it's even uh, more complicated on the site because you've got to retain so much water and it becomes difficult if you've got a tight uh, location, not enough acreage to uh, deal properly with all of that drainage and, and runoff that you need. Right? You don't have enough room for your ponds, so you have to think of other ways to do it. Um, you're also working on all the access routes to the building. So if people park in the parking lot, how are they going to get into the building? How are they going to get back out of it? If they're, if it's in an urban environment and you've got sidewalks, how do they cross over to the building from the sidewalk and get to it? Especially if they have to cross through the parking lot, uh, to get their site grading. That's your, that's your, um, well, your grades, that's the slope that you have in your parking lot and on your sidewalks. You're checking two things. One, that you have enough slope that your water is going to go where you want it to. Because, you know, check out drainage. It's above it. Um, you're also making sure it's not too steep, which is an ADA rec requirement, right? So you, on a sidewalk, your longitudinal grade can't be over 5%. And your, your cross slope can't be more than 2%. So you're going to make sure that any place where you expect people to walk... I uh, would expect any people to walk, particularly uh, delineated walk areas, sidewalks and crosswalks, that you're within those boundaries, right? So you'll immediately fail if, you're, if your grades are greater than that in any of those spots, right? In the parking lot, uh, the trick is, is that you can't be too flat because you need to keep that water moving to get it off the parking lot. And construction uh, tolerances are not great. All right, so if you show a half percent, technically that's good enough to get water to move. But in a big parking lot, it's hard to get a contractor to consistently get a half percent cross slope across your parking lot. You're going to want to stay up in the one to two percent range because there, even if they have a little error keeping their grade, um, is still enough. It's probably within the boundaries. You're still going to get flow. You're not going to have ponds. It's what you really don't want is you don't stand in water in your parking lot. So those are all issues uh, to keep in mind when you get into site design and through there, right? So the, the half percent on a road project, your your profile grade line, half percent on a road, is more likely the contractor will work, will figure that out because a long linear project like that, they can follow line and grade much better than a, than a great big wide open parking lot. It's easier to lose your grade in that, right, and to maintain those tolerances. Roads tend to be a little bit better, so you can use smaller grades. So there's a long discussion that we didn't really intend to get into, but there you are. That's free. And then these public utility connections are talked about, your sewer and your water connections. All of that is up to you as a civil engineer uh, to do in a site design project, right? And if you are working on a site design for senior design, this would be in included in your elements that you'd work on right, through there. Um, what are what are some of the design criteria? We talk about this with roads. What what are you designing the road for? What vehicle? What size of vehicle? And um, are they turning? Are they going straight through? What's the weight and all that? Uh, for a commercial project, really the biggest thing we would design for is an SUV vehicle, straight truck, unless it's in the delivery area. All right. So if you think about some of the uh, shopping centers in Valparaiso, if you're out by, by Silhady, right along the front where the public is parking, those are fairly tight parking lots. And we're going to see some of those here in a second. Those, you know, a straight truck could probably get through there if they needed to. Right. It's really built for cars and um, passenger vehicles, we can call them, small trucks and SUVs and so forth. Uh, through there on the back side of those buildings is where their loading docks are there they have their uh, wider doors for accepting shipments of whatever's coming in um, those you might want to consider to make sure a semi truck can get in and out of those areas because that's where you expect them you wouldn't expect them to go by the front where the uh, customers would be parking at least ideally you would keep those two separated 
All right, so just keep in mind, who are you designing for? If you're doing a site design for an industrial complex, you're definitely going to be all about trucks and knowing where the shipping and receiving centers are and that you provide very adequate uh, radiuses and, and roadway widths back there and turning areas uh, for trucks because you're going to expect, you know, a number of trucks a day coming through there. So it's, it's worth the extra money to really make them comfortable and uh, get through that. All right. So we keep in mind where the drop-off and pickup areas are. Healthcare is really big on having curbside drop-off and pickup. That's right, so why I worked on a couple of medical buildings. That was a big thing. You always have an awning out front. You want to be able to have um, people uh, come up and pick up their uh, whoever coming in or, or dropping people off at the hospital, either one. But you want to usually have a canopy out front so you can uh, pull in under it and keep out of the rain and so forth uh, through there. So that was a big area an issue. Also, a uh, hotel we did was really big on their drop-off and pickup area. We had to make the canopy really high so they could get a tour bus under it because it was in Amish country and he expected a lot of tour buses uh, to come through. All right, so keep that in mind, you know, um, and that's, a lot of a lot of businesses like to really, I guess I'd say, tart up that drop off and pick up area because they think it has a really good curb appeal. Look at this great big awning sticking out there. Right? Um, it shows uh, it's like conspicuous consumption. It shows how wealthy your business is because you've got this great big awning. And those things are expensive uh, to put that out over the road. So, um, but that's and then the architects like to go nuts with it and make it super pretty. Whatever. Um, through there. Ped connections, make sure you're well connected to the city around you if you're in an urban environment and that you'll know, be thinking anywhere on your site if there's a pedestrian who's on your site uh, coming in from you know a neighboring property one side or the other how are they going to get into your building and so you follow that all the way through. Parking is obviously a big issue here in the U.S. especially in in a suburban setting which is mostly Valpo. Um, there's a lot of, we care a lot about parking and that's the main access, probably 95% or more of our people are going to be entering our buildings and using these sites who are going to be driving there, right? So the parking is a big issue with that. Drainage, again, will ruin your project if you don't get your drainage right. And then space for landscaping. And this is sometimes required by law and in most places nowadays require some landscaping around it. Uh, through there, but a lot of times it's also just for aesthetics that the owner wants wants it to look nice, and so they they put in a lot of landscaping. Landscaping is incredibly expensive as well. I didn't realize that until I worked for an architect. And, um, but just just the plants that uh, and a landscape architect picks out to go on a site on just a standard sized little commercial uh, standalone building, it can be fifty or sixty thousand dollars of just landscaping stuff. All right, so it's not trivial do that. The, and this, we're doing transportation design, so we're going to focus on the parking, the entrance design, and the ped and bike elements, because that's a little more classically what a transportation uh, professional would do, right? So that's that's what we're focusing on within site design. That's what we're going to focus on, right? So parking is the biggest one. And again, yeah, it's transportation design class. Parking is the main way we here in, in Indiana get to wherever we're going. Um, and the two biggest questions we have to ask is how many spaces, how many parking spaces do we need, and how am I going to lay these out, and how big do they have to be? All right. And to a degree, both of those things uh, depend on what town or county that you're in, right? and it's a jurisdictional thing, and they've got rules that you have to follow to get approval for your site. And you have to design it, send, uh, send the city your plans, the city reviews it and says, yes, so you've met our standards, you may move ahead. All right. If you don't get that, then your your project doesn't get built. All right. So just remember that how many spaces you need particularly is almost always covered um, by the city or the town that you're inside of in their jurisdiction. Right. And almost always they also specify the minimum size of the spaces. All right. Here's the city of Valparaiso. This is their unified development ordinance uh, through there. <coughs> I, I just took a section out of this and blew it up a little bit so you could see what the standard requirements are. And you'll find something similar to this in almost every jurisdiction. Right? So for a library, for every thousand square feet of floor space, you need five parking spaces. All right. So 
that there's your for a high school well you have to do a special study for that there's no set value for it daycare center college or university for us evalpo we'd have to have a special study uh, done for it uh, monasteries and convents not sure how many of those we have in the area but you would need one parking space for every two rooms so they you know not because you don't expect everybody to have a car when I mean, going through there. Places of worship and so forth. So you can go through this, and there's a whole section on commercial things. This is this, the piece I, I pulled out of it for now. And and this is this is a requirement. Uh, this is part of a law. It's a unified development ordinance that was passed in the law by the jurisdiction that you're in. This would be the city of Valparaiso City Council uh, approved this measure. And, and if you don't have five spaces for every thousand uh, square feet in the library, they won't approve your plans, right? You're going to have to find those five spaces somewhere through that or make your building a little bit smaller right maybe it's just your your site just isn't large enough or you can ask for a variance and you mm, variances aren't uncommon but you got to be careful not to ask for too many and it should be for a really good reason right, through that if you don't have an ordinance and if you want to just engage it, like those ones that said special study, there's also this ITE manual that's a parking generation manual. ITE goes around, they check, they did surveys and found out, well, for, let's say, a school, um, we counted how many cars are parked out here based on how many students are in the school or how big the school is in square feet. And we, we plot these lines. We do some linear regression. We try to calculate, well, if you've got 400 students, you should expect this many parking spaces are going to be needed. And so it's just, it's really, it's all very empirical based. It's based on data they've pulled and brought together into, um, into a study like that. So this, that's another tool uh, we can use. Through there, this is what it looks like. Uh, so, for a general office building, we'd say this is based on a thousand square foot of gross floor area. So, total uh, floor area inside the office building, based uh, per um, one thousand square feet. So, down here, these are in in thousands of square feet. This is two hundred thousand square foot building. Here is a hundred thousand square foot building, fifty thousand square foot building. Right. So, for general office buildings, that's the normal size. Here's all the studies they've done. All right, and then they did curve fitting. They did a straight average, which is the dotted line, and then they do a fitted curve, which is the solid line right, through here. If they have enough data to do a good fitted curve, then they give you the equation for the curve down here. All right, and it's an R squared of 86. That is good, right? I would trust this fitted curve very well, right? That's, this is really good data uh, through that. You can see, especially in this lower range, it fits very well with how many parking spaces were needed. And the average rate is for every thousand square feet of office building that you've got, you're going to need 2.39 um, parking spaces. So that's the average rate. And it gives you the range and the, the confidence interval and all of that right through there. So if you don't have a fitted curve, you just use the average rate. If you have a fitted curve, usually we use the fitted curve, especially with an R squared of 0.86. That's a really good that's a really good one, right? And they had 148 studies. That's pretty good. That's a lot of data points, right? Some of them have like 12. And so you'll see they're just very scattered and there's no good fitted curve for them, right? General office buildings are very common use. And so we have a lot of studies going into that. So that's how we would use this. That's how we would derive our parking. This is telling you what the land use type is. It's a general office building. This tells you what the uh, independent variable is. And this is by, based on a thousand square feet. It could be like a school. There is one setting that's based on number of students. And then yeah, um, for churches, sometimes it's based on number of expected congregants uh, coming there. The most common one, most common variable we use is square foot, footage, and that's what this one is using for that. This is what time of day that we're looking at the period for the, the parking, and we're looking between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. So um, we also have a very similar looking chart for traffic and how many cars to expect, how many trips to expect in and out of a business. And that will be separated by sometimes total day time or like the peak a.m., peak p.m., so forth and so on. This is telling you what time of day uh, that's going on. Here's that average rate. Here's the fitted equation. All right. So that's one another way to determine how many parking spaces you need if it isn't just laid out by the ordinance. And usually you start with the ordinance. If you want more information, then you use that trip generation or parking generation manual 
uh, then on top of it. All right, the next piece we got to look at is ADA spots, uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, and this is handicap spaces. So I know you all, when you roll up to your favorite restaurant and you think there's an empty spot, nope, it's a handicap spot when you get there, all right? How do we determine how many handicap spots are needed? People just guess? No, they don't guess, right? This is all laid out. This is also law. We have to require, uh, we have to provide uh, this number of spaces by law. Uh, for it. So if you've got between one parking space up to 25, one of those has to be handicapped. And one of them has to, and of that one, that one has to be uh, van accessible. And this is for the wheelchair uh, elevators that come out of the sides of vans. You have to have a little wider space next to it. So technically, if you only have one parking space, it has to be handicapped and it has to be wheelchair accessible, which means only handicapped people can come to your building. Hmm, isn't that odd? Well, I've never seen a development yet that only had one parking space. So that's not how you can get a variance, right, for that. Um, so, but 1 to 25, you need one space, and then 26 to 50, you need two handicapped spaces. One of them is for a van. Um, this is our more common range, right, 101 to 150. You'd have five handicapped spaces. And you'd have one of those, still as a van, right, and so forth and so on. And so down here, you can see we've got to really high numbers. It's like a shopping mall uh, down here. 2% of total spaces are going to be handicapped spaces. And then one-sixth of whatever's in this column is going to be van accessible. And these are really big. You know, this is like at the airport. <laughs> you get a thousand or more, right, for that. Van accessible, you've got a 96-inch wide uh, aisle, which is that blue cross-hatched area next to the parking space. And that's where the little uh, ramp will come out or the little elevator uh, lift will drop out of your van. You know, it comes down in that 96-inch space. This is what it looks like, right? Here's your, your van accessible space. And here is this uh, wheelchair uh, friendly area next to it. So if your van pulls in here and you put out the ramp, you've got the space for it, right? If we didn't have this here, you wouldn't be able to open the door and get your wheelchair out if it's a side load one, right? So that's why we leave these spaces. And it's okay if uh, the area, this could also be considered a van accessible uh, handicapped spot. It doesn't matter which side this van accessible buffer area is the aisle is on, you could also expect people to back in if they needed to uh, and use the other side of the van uh, for their lift gate. So you can put them on either side of the aisle. And quite often, if we have a van accessible parking needed and, and more than one space, we'll do this. We'll share a single aisle in between uh, two van spaces. And you'll put it on the sign that it's a van accessible one. And here's a side note, right? A handicapped space is not legally a handicapped space unless it has a sign, right? And special signs are used for the van accessible ones. People know that's van accessible, but, but no handicapped space is technically handicapped unless it has a sign. You can put the little wheelchair symbol down here. You can paint it in blue lines, but it's not a handicapped accessible spot until it has a sign. So. Keep that in mind. Right? There was a little tidbit I learned. Um, parking stall dimensions, and so we call these parking stalls. And this is uh, this whole aisle. Here's our aisle. Here's our, our total width on our layout. Ooh, went too far. And then we've got the individual parking spaces in it, right? But this is the stall is this whole area right through here. And, and typically we're going to be either straight in, which is a 90 degree uh, turn into it, and that would be for a two-way parking area. Or you'd use an angle parking, and typically I would use 60 degrees for my angle parking. Now you can do, there's, we see here in a second, there's multiple uh, options there. I would suggest one or the other of these. If it's a two-space, it's two-directional one, I'd use 90 degrees, but single direction, I would use a 60-degree angle like this one. This is a single direction. You're only really supposed to be driving this way because they're all angled towards you then, and you can pull in through there. Usually, you know, 10 by 20 is a good parking space. That'll cover almost every vehicle we've got. Even uh, even these um, bigger pickup trucks are fine in a 10 by 20. But the minimum you're going to get down to is by 9 by 18. <clears throat> and most of those ordinances, like the City of Valparaiso ordinance, this is the minimum size. You could technically, cars aren't quite that wide. Right? A car is 7.5 to 8 feet wide. You could fit it in an 8 foot wide spot, but you have nothing left over. But this is a little bit tight. And again, if, especially in a more of a suburban area where you may have more pickup trucks and stuff, you're going to want to go with this 10 by 20. 
if you have the space. Now, if you're running out of space, you may have to drop down to a 9 by 18. The city, whatever ordinance you've got, that development ordinance, is probably going to lay this out for you. There's a minimum size, and you're going to use it for there. Where might you want to use a 10 by 20 also? Where might you, on purpose, use a slightly bigger space like it's 10 by 20? Hearing no answer, the, I'll tell you, it's uh, grocery stores. So like at grocery stores, we like to put a little more space between the cars because you've got carts and you're going to be loading stuff. You're going to be opening up your doors maybe on the side and trying to load groceries into it or any other kind of a business, you know, the Costco's, the Target's even, um, shopping centers like that where you're bringing a cart out to the car. You're going to want to make your spaces bigger because that gives you more space in between the vehicles to load stuff and get in and out of it uh, through there. Maybe in an office park, a 9 by 18 is fine because people aren't in and out of those vehicles that much. And you're not hauling things. You come in once uh, in the morning and you leave in the evening. Uh, so you're only out of your car once. And it's very low turnover right? through that. Uh, here's some, some diagrams, uh, tables that we use with that um, uh, parking layout. And so in this case, uh, I'm showing you this here. These are these aisle widths, right? And this is, we're measuring this back here, this aisle width. Here's your AW, there it is. That's our aisle width. Here's our uh, total width of this stall, you know, through there. If it's wall to wall or interlocking, I'll show you the difference here in a second. And then these are these dimensions, which you can see back over here. Hmm, thought they'd be over here. <laughs> okay, we'll see them in a second. Um, uh, uh, oh, it's, this is parking class. Sorry, I thought this was a set dimension All right through there. And this is based on whether you're doing a 90 degree in, 60 degree in, angled, uh, 75, 60 or 45 uh, degree angles through there. So, so let's let's go through these a little more exactly. So this is that aisle width. This is the area, clear area, between the ends of the parking spaces that you'd be normally driving through, either one way or two way. Two-way aisle, 60 degrees, you got a 26-foot width. A one-way aisle at 60 degrees is only 18-foot width, right? You don't have to pass anybody, so it's okay to be 18 through here, right? Our travel lanes on a road are 12 feet, so 18 is leaving you some extra on your side in case someone's got their truck hitch uh, uh, out here sticking out into the aisle, or you need some maneuvering room to be able to safely turn into these. You can't, you don't have any room to maneuver in a 12-foot lane, so we're going to use an 18 for the one-way. If it's interlocking, it's like this, where it's this like kind of zipper, uh, herringbone kind of uh, form there. You'd need 51 feet to the nominal center of these, the ends of these parking bays, right? If you were doing this line here, the one way 60 degrees, <coughs> you'd need 59 feet if it was interlocking, if it was a two-way one, right? And then the wall to wall is up here. If, if this is up against a wall right here, the front of your car can be right along this line. In the wall one, the front right corner is here, but then you're just really wasting the rest of that space. So you need a little more room on the wall to wall one. You can see the 6254. It's a little bit wider up there. All right, through that. Let's look at some examples, right? So this is kind of like an interlocking one, and this is supposed to be one way um, aisles. And it's a large parking lot, so we're going to talk about that here in a second. Now, the striping person who painted these lines didn't want to have to jig-jag around and put all those little herringbone shapes in there, so they just put a straight line down. Whoa, back up. They just put a straight line down. That was just, just to save their time, right, and hassle uh, in that. And you can see people don't really care where that line is anyway. They're going to park wherever they want, so they're a little bit over the line uh, and so forth. And people don't, this is guys parked in backwards. He didn't care which direction you're supposed to be going in. He's over here in the corner. He's going to park wherever he wants, right? I'll do that. They probably an employee uh, right through there. So a one-way angled spaces are more efficient. You're going, to, you're going to be able to pack, if it's a larger parking lot, you're going to be able to pack more parking spaces into the same area because you've got a narrow aisle and then even this uh, stall width uh, in here or bay width, uh, we call it sometimes, is going to be smaller because you're going one way and have your angle uh, direction going through there. Now, at the ends, you've got odd shapes, right? You know, most 
things or at least around here are rectilinear and so you've got an angle coming in so you're just you're gonna have some wasted space at the ends right so there's some inefficiency there you can put little planters in it and make tr put trees in there and make it look pretty uh, if you want to right, so there's some inefficiencies there um, but for a larger parking lot then this one-way aisle uh, is a good way to not a bad way at least um, to work it out right so here's Here's layout dimensions with just one way angled again, right? And this is a big parking lot and efficient. Here's our handicap spacing. These are our spaces. This is van accessible. Look how wide that aisle is, right? That's equal to the width, basically, of the van parking space itself. These are probably not van accessible because this is a narrower aisle. You can still walk between them, um, but you don't have that kind of space to, to throw your ramp out if you're in the, in the truck, in the van there. And, and this is at Best Buy here in Valpo. And here's our one-way aisles uh, through that. And you can see, well, if I come down here, I didn't see a space. It's easy for me to go this way or that way and come back down the other side and find a space. Well, if I didn't see one there, I can still, I can zigzag through. I can find my way around, right? And so you've got multiple aisles. It's That's good for traffic flow. And the one-way angled, this is a more efficient uh, use of space at this size of parking lot, which is there's a fair bit of number of spots in here, right? So that's that's an efficient use uh, for that one, right? Here's Aldi's, which is just just across the driveway there from Best Buy. So this is a smaller parking lot, and this is not one way. Um, these are not one way aisles. These are two way aisles. They are 90 degrees, right? You can see the difference, right? Here's a one way aisle, and you can turn in at an angle. And then here is two-way aisles, and it's all straight in 90 degrees through here, right? And um, in this case, in a smaller parking lot like this, so like if these were one-way aisles, well, I could go here, and then I had to come back, and then which direction is this one going, right? So you can trap people. So you can got to be careful about that. This has a lot of opportunities. You've got two in each direction, right? You can zigzag through this. It works well in this case to have one-way aisles. In a small parking lot like this, you're not going to get away with it, right? Maybe, so is this in and these are both out? But then if you come back around, how you get to do it? Anyway, it'd be a mess if you tried to make these one-way aisles in this size of a parking lot. So they widened their, they widened the spacing. These are much tighter here in this one-way aisle. This is wider to allow two-way uh, traffic. And now you have this 90-degree turns in turn in and being Aldi's this has probably got wider spaces they probably used a wider space if they could if they had room for it they probably would and they put their handicap spots up here in the front here's van accessible look how wide that van accessible aisle way is you know right next to it and then it's easy access into the building and yes we do try to put them as close to the entrance as possible uh, through there and it wasn't spelled out in the in the previous slides but yeah that's where we like to put them not always dead center right in front of it sometimes you know wherever a good access point is near a sidewalk and a ramp uh, we may have to move them down just a little bit from the right in front of the entrance so it just depends a little bit on your site where you're at all right so what about this what do you think about this design okay this is down here's panera over here and here's Cadoba. i don't know what else is in the shopping center but this is out there by sil Havy, right so um, here's our handicap space with the aisle, the great big spot. Oh, and this one's not, so only vans here, here, no vans. Um, here is also another handicap spot, which you can see the aisle coming out there. And I say, you know, they, they jiggered these lines around and it's just diabolical. I mean, this is an awful, um, spot. I mean, look at this. I don't know what this is, but it's like he's parked over multiple lanes there, there, right? So you would think you could pull through, right? And you pull up here in these and you think, oh, I'm just going to pull through. And like, oh, wait a minute. I'm halfway between two other spots. There's no way to pull through, even if this one was empty, right? You can't do, oh, unless you're a bicycle, you're not going to do that <laughs> through there. So these, I, you know, if you're looking at it, for some reason, they made this side wider than that side. I'm not quite sure why, unless it's a little bit of sight distance or turning radius, but they didn't really round that off. Um, but, you know, why not just scoot that down and line these up? I don't know. So that, that was their choice. Maybe they got one additional parking space out of it. That would be my guess. Because they, they slunked this thing down smaller and they got... And they ate into this island on the end. They got one more space. Okay, 
more power to you get one more space all right look at all this waste out here that's where odd angles aren't aren't very good for you all right here's this is from a traffic engineering handbook by ITE here's what standard dimensions are and so Astro passenger vehicles, uh, the width is about seven feet, 19 feet long. You've got a three foot overhang. That's between the uh, front or rear tire to the end of the vehicle. The, you've got an overhang of about three feet in there. The wheelbase, the, dis the center to center distance between your axles is about 11 feet for a passenger car. Track width between your tires is six feet. No, it is not exactly like an ancient Roman. Uh, chariot, which is what you read sometimes, that's an urban myth. Those are only four and some feet wide. So our current cars are not built off chariot dimensions. Sorry. Um, here's a turn radius, 21 feet, and a turning circle. All right, so that's that's the passenger car we're supposed to be designing for, right? 19 feet long, 7 feet wide. Here's pickup trucks. Here's a Ram 3500. Look, it's not as wide as the passenger vehicle we're designing for. It is fairly long. Okay, and it's got more overhang. Okay, I can believe that. And they typically have a bad turning radius, right? Ford E350, this is the one ton, 15 passenger van. And it's not seven feet wide either. And it's a little bit shorter than the passenger car. And its overhang is even less. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, this is what Qatar uses for their roadways, their 99th uh, percentile. Um, here's what U.S. parking regulations suggest. 6.58, blah, blah, blah. Here's an 98 Ford Expedition. That's a big vehicle. Here's a 2014 Ford Expedition. Got 0.02 <laughs> feet wider. How's that? And about um, uh, 0.2 feet longer. That's, what, three or four inches longer through there. Slightly bigger overhang uh, and so forth. Wheelbase actually got a little shorter. That's funny. And there's Sequoia and all that. So here's some ideas, right? And and this is what Ashto says we should use. Right? Isn't that kind of funny? That that was what Ashto suggested in 1959, right? So it's not it's not surprising that the width of it is actually bigger than a, a one ton Ram pickup truck in the 99th percentile. Right? Look at how big that is. So this is the 1959 and here it is Here's the 1959 passenger automobile from the U.S. That's what Ashto is still basing their stuff on, right? Does that make you feel good that we're using their Ashto Green Book for all of our design and, and this is what they're still basing things on? Hey, you know, 59 must have been a good year for cars. I don't know. Uh, so that's what we're actually designing for is this sucker. Look at that. Look out. This is that overhang distance right here. That's a lot of overhang. You know, more, most cars these days don't have that kind of overhang. Right. So anyway, I thought that was funny. All right, here's another little diagram. This is from that uh, uh, ITE uh, transportation handbook uh, through there. This is what they call the zero percentile. There's almost none of these smart for twos out there. It's a, it's a tiny car, right? It's super tiny. Uh, actually, the Toyota Tacoma is the median right now. It's a 50th, at the 50th percentile. Uh, Sequoia, their full-size pickup truck, is going to be the 85th percentile. And this is a Ram uh, three-quarter ton. The one ton is probably the same body size, pretty much. Uh, it's just got better suspension. All right, for it. So the last slide showed that uh, 3,500 is the 99th percentile. But that's, that's just showing you kind of the size um, breakdown of what our percentiles are. So here's our average vehicles, actually about the size of a, a Toyota Tacoma. All right. And the Sequoia, I guess the Sequoia is actually the SUV. Uh, the Toyota is SUV. So it's even bigger. Now, and this isn't as big a pickup truck, obviously, as the American uh, models and the Tacoma. Here's a little side by side comparison, right? Here's my car. And uh, <laughs> it's a standard, just a little Ford Focus, right? 40 miles per gallon. I got to throw that in there. It's 40 miles per gallon, right? And here's this truck, right? This is a Ram. I don't know if that's a 2500 or if that's just a standard. But, you know, crew cab. Okay. He's, Got a little wider tires than normal. You can see how much difference we and how we use up the space in that parking space is, right? So, and maybe he's not pulled completely forward, but he's, he's definitely coming out near the end of the parking space and is filling the width uh, quite a bit there, right? And here's my little car. Right? I used to have a three quarter ton pickup truck and it was a bear to park and to get in and out of if you're in a tight parking space, right? I was like, uh, 
something like uh, going to Culver's would be hard to get in and out of those parking spaces. You'd have to take two tries usually to get the big truck in there uh, through that. And this was over at the hotel, so this was um, maybe a little easier to get in and out of those parking spaces. All right. So let's just give you a, a real-world comparison on how much space vehicles use. Uh, use. And so what we're trying to, really, we're trying to cover at least the 85th percentile if we had our, if our choice. We'd try to cover the 85th percentile of all the vehicles would fit comfortably in our parking spaces. And then the bigger ones can fit with a little bit of effort. Right, and even the 1959 cars can fit in our current spaces because we still have those standards that we're using. All right, here's some examples of of aisle layout. Um, here we've got this little island on the end of our uh, parking bays. Right, and what's what's the use of that? Why would we want to put a little island on the end of our parking bay? Landscaping is one good thing. Uh, put our light poles in there and use to put a curve around it so it's kind of protected uh, through there. The other thing is we need sight distance. And so if we were to park cars right up to the edge of the um, passing roadway at the ends of these, our circulatory roadways, at the ends of these parking bays, you wouldn't be able to see uh, people coming until you're out in in traffic basically and yeah you shouldn't be going too fast in the parking lot but you know people do <laughs> so you're going to be able to see some distance right and so using not using this end stall and using it as landscaping and making a little island in it that gives you that sight distance all right so now we can use it like this we can uh, see through that so don't plant too big a plants in here and completely block people's view right shorter shrubs are fine uh, through that or an occasional tree as long as it's not too huge you don't want a wall of vegetation that's what you don't want there here's another example we can use this um, to be able to see uh, either end so uh, that kind of covers parking as our first step our first stop maybe you might say in site design and again in the transportation side of site design this is going to occupy a lot of your time right parking lots i don't know i don't know that these layouts look easy. I don't know if they do or not uh, to you. They are not. I will tell you that, right? And you're going to fuss around and fuss around and fuss around with your parking lot layouts if you do site design. It's it's iterative, right? You know, there's no... Every site's different. Every site has unique shapes and, and configurations and how many spaces you need is unique. And... Um, your your traffic flow, um, how you want traffic to move through. Do you want them to circulate by the front of your building or do you want to keep the circulation away from the front of the building? Um, there's a lot of considerations that go into parking lot layout. And so just remember that it's there's not a, a quick template that you can just throw in there and, and automatically get what you need, right? You're going to lay out these parking lots. It's going to take some time. It's bit of a chore. Um, AutoCAD has some advanced tools that will add spaces in kind of automatically for you or help you. You give it the line and it, it throws in all these side ones. All right, there's a lot of drafting in Paul. I used to do this by hand. There's a lot of drafting in here of offset, 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 you know, and, and making them look right um, through that. The You get them laid out and then you're going to count spaces and you're going to see if you've got enough. And then you're going to adjust. Oop, I'm missing the space. So I'm going to adjust. I need far more spaces. I'm going to need to add some over here. But now I don't have enough room for my, my pond, uh, for my drainage, right? So there's, it's a lot of trade-off. And it's, it's, it's an iterative approach, like most things we've been doing in, in civil engineering. It's kind of iterative, right? You're going to get started. You have a concept in mind. You see if it works. If it doesn't, you adjust. Maybe start over. Um, and work on that. So parking lots, um, maybe we didn't uh, dwell on them a long time, but they are not easy. They're not the end of the world either. It's not rocket science, but it they're they take some effort to do well. And I I can definitely show you some examples of poor uh, parking lots that got built um, by uh, quote unquote great uh, site design firms <laughs> that um, yeah anyway. I've got my own opinions <laughs> so on that. Uh, doing, good, doing good site design and doing good parking lots is is not easy. But I think as a as a consumer, as someone who goes into these places, you've probably got a feel for what which ones work and which ones don't. 
and uh, we could try if we were in class we could take a poll and uh, you might be able to pick out some places here in, in town that you think are awful and are terrible parking uh, situations or not well designed and too tight and and so forth uh, through that all right so next time we'll we'll uh, continue on a little bit with more some more site design uh, stuff and we'll go from there